I think that our first speaker today, uh, Bob Iger from the Walt Disney Company, really set the stage nicely for the next uh, panel that we're about to have by talking about the way Hollywood is reinventing itself. So we're going to bring Richard Siklos from Fortune back up on stage to lead a conversation with a couple of other gentlemen who are on the front lane, lines of this transformation. Uh, Dave Maisel is chairman of Marvel Studios. Ben Silverman is co-chairman of NBC Entertainment, and Robert Weisenthal serves as executive vice president and chief financial officer of Sony Corporation of America, and he's also chief strategy officer of Sony Entertainment. Please welcome Dave, Ben, Robert, and Richard back to the stage. Thank you for joining us all. The, uh, the title of this discussion is Reinventing Hollywood. And like me, you're probably marveling at the great diversity of gender, age, and ethnicity uh, that we've uh, pulled together for this panel. Um, but there is, there is a, a logic to uh, a, a different logic to it, which is that um, each of, each of uh, the panel members come from a very different uh, perspective um, different companies, obviously, but uh, different aspects of this. And, I, and uh, what I thought I'd do to start off is maybe ask e you know, each of you to talk about what you're doing in the context of, of the following statement, which is there's been this perception that Hollywood is a, you know, wrestling with a broken business model for years now, the declining business for obvious reasons I don't need to um, recite now against this idea since the downturn hit that Hollywood is, is, is actually within the media industry a bit of a, a uh, bastion of stability compared to you know, many of the television and movie businesses in particular um, because of some of the existing business models is more stable perhaps than a lot of other media industries. So maybe we could just go, go down the row, um, start with Rob, Robert Wiesenthal who's been with Sony for nine years and has a broad view. Well, I think the studios have actually been remarkably stable, if you think about the assets, how long all the major studios have been around. Um, and I think one benefit that the studios have over uh, other forms of content, and that for a number of years now, uh, the studios have done a very good job thinking about pricing, thinking about windows, slicing content, thinking about different ways of monetizing. And if you look in the rearview mirror of what happened to the music industry, and we obviously at Sony had a front row seat uh, with Sony Music. Um, you, what you really see is that it was very much focused, obviously in the later years, on getting those plastic discs out without a lot of work being done on the alternative revenue streams. That has changed enormously in the past uh, five years. Um, but I think that now that everybody's seen at least one part of content being transformed, what you're seeing in Hollywood is a lot more openness in terms of experimentation, uh, exploring pricing, windows, forms of distribution, uh, and the thought of exclusivity with one type of platform or the kind of content protection that you saw in the early days of music. You really don't hear that anymore. Um, back in the early days of digital and music, it really was, you think about copy protection, totally impeded the user experience pre-iTunes. Uh, because it was about, we can't let this song get on the internet. Um, and now it's really about, copy protection is about keeping honest people honest. If someone wants to spend nine hours hacking into a movie um, of David's in order to get, you know, and to get a copy of you know, people's heads going up in the middle of camcordered from you know, the local movie plex and watching in four inches and having it stutter for five hours, and they, they make that investment, that friction, that time is money. But if you give someone an alternative where they can pay for it and it's a quality experience, most people will do the right thing. So I think there have been a lot of lessons learned. Cool. Ben, you, uh, you run NBC. Uh, obviously, the broadcast TV networks have, have some very obvious um, challenges right now. Tell, and, and you've been in your position a couple of years now, came from the outside. Tell, tell me about what you're seeing. Well, um, clearly, digital delivery transformed our model. Our number one competition, though, is, is still television. It's cable. You know, that, that's really uh, part of what is evolving in our business is the top cable networks and the broadcast networks 
uh, starting to get closer and closer in absolute ratings, especially in the summertime when the broadcast nets uh, can't rely on repeats the way they used to, and the cable networks are investing heavily in uh, new original programming. Um, but overall, more people are watching TV the same way that more people are going to the movies. The economic reset uh, really hurt our core advertising base, which is um, you know, the big, biggest issue. An unhealthy Fortune 100 is, uh, is unhealthy for a big uh, main revenue stream advertising business. Um, but the other businesses uh, around it that were maybe less effective or more experimental have been hit, to your point, even harder. And we've just closed one of our first uh, upfront deals uh, that came out of our uh, in-front presentations with Group M. And you're seeing uh, healthier numbers than I think we had uh, anticipated or forecasted for uh, the advertisers and because they realize there's an efficiency in utilizing uh, broadcast television as opposed to assembling uh, eyeballs through multiple new uh, outlets and platforms. Um, but we need to continue to do a better job at talking to our advertisers further upstream <coughs> and engaging them and, and being a partner in their campaigns and their creative strategy, not just a commodity broker of uh, CPMs. And that's a real shift that we've been taking a lead in and is being uh, applauded by the advertising community. <coughs> and uh, I think we'll pay off uh, even more and more uh, looking to the future, and as Rob mentioned, the windowing and the new revenue streams that come from the new technologies, if you embrace them, uh, while not making up for um, the potential shortfall in <coughs> top line advertising, are all um, cumulative and additive. So the DVD, the TV <coughs> on DVD, is you know a seven year old business, <coughs> and it's adding hundreds of millions of dollars to the bo bottom line and day and date global distribution of television shows, which is something the movie business has been doing. That's also helping um, bring the revenue streams closer together and collapsing the revenue streams that you used to have to wait for syndication as the payday and go four to five years. You now can be break even uh, on a show in a first or second year. So you know, while, while a lot of the story is about the broken business model, there's also a lot of positive uh, elements to it as well and, uh, and opportunity. Um, <clears throat> sorry about the cough. <laughs> <clears throat> David, in your business, um, I wanted you on the, well, <clears throat> I wanted you on the panel because Marvel is a relatively new company in, in, the, in the film business and um, you're actually, you're not, you know, you're in a challenge industry, but you've been a growth story so far. So while I get my voice back, maybe you can. Okay. Yeah, it's, you know, looking sort of the past five years at Marvel, there has been a lot of dynamic change. And frankly, a large part of it hasn't necessarily been caused by technology. It's been caused by a rethinking of our business model. You know, being a pure play intellectual property or brand company, um, a lot of factors allowed us to take more control of our destiny and instead of <coughs> license uh, out a lot of the key activities, especially the movies, do it ourselves. Um, that's been a fundamental shift in our company in taking control of our destiny and making more value from our characters. Technology, though, is now helping us take that to the next level. You know, there, there are some challenges, obviously, for all content companies and movie companies with changes in the DVD marketplace and what's going to be happening online and VOD and so on. At the same time, there's <coughs> great opportunities for us in getting a better direct relationship with our customer. You know, we have fans that you know, start at seven and go to 97. And over time, technology should allow us to have a, a, you know, a direct relationship, a direct commerce relationship, a direct marketing relationship with those customers uh, and hopefully maximize their lifetime value. You know, we're already seeing that a bit on just the pure marketing of our movies. Um, uh, with Iron Man, and, and we'll see it more with Iron Man 2 next year. You know, the internet, the interactive mediums for marketing is becoming a bigger, bigger percent of the budget, and probably one of the most dynamic, exciting parts of our activities in marketing the film. You know, it becomes very viral, things build up. We have Comic Con starting tomorrow, and things will go on the internet already and build up to the release of the film. 
and we're, everyone's trying to get better and better at helping to facilitate that and provide as much uh, you know, uh, firepower for that kind of viral technology. You know, our director, John Favreau, uh, did MySpace posts for Iron Man 1, and now he's doing Twitter posts um, for Iron Man 2. And you know, six or seven times a day, fans can now follow what's happening with the actual making of the movie, which was never possible before. Um, but in a way, your, um, Marvel is probably among the, the companies that has succeeded in this environment least because of technology. Um, and, and, a, and a question for, for everyone also is, um, do you feel like the, the industry is, you know, is the broad, can you make decent money in the broadcast business? You know, most of the networks are either not making money or making very little of it. So going back to you, Ben, is, is, there, a, is, there, a, is there a, is it just a kind of a transitional period when all television channels move towards some kind of pay system, or does broadcasting have a future in the ecosystem? Um, it's, it's definitely challenged. I mean, there, there are real issues. There are real issues on, on the local level, and there's real issues on uh, the broadcast channel itself that uh, need to be addressed. The cable model is a much better model. It's a dual revenue stream and, uh, and really enables um, a lot higher margin uh, for, for the cable channels, but the broadcast networks still can assemble the largest audience, and when they do the right things, live things, topical things, day and date. We have a show mm -hmm. on uh, Last Night America's Got Talent that had over 15 million viewers and, you know, and, and dominated the ratings and drove awareness and is creating a conversation about Susan Boyle today, and, you know, and all of that is, um, and Obama's our lead-in, which is good for us tonight. And uh, all of that, it really enables, um, enables, I think, those opportunities around the killer apps. One of the things in these conferences, and something that we don't talk a lot about, is technology isn't changing the actual content as, as much as you would have you thought. Mm -hmm. you know, mil, who wants to be millionaire had the phone a friend and you know, this democracy of the game show that anyone could, uh, right. could be on. You know, and, and it kind of made it not like the ca uh, casting the person to be on the show, but actually your intelligence got you on. And American Idol put the power of choice in the audience's hand, but it's still just telephony. You know? and, and it'll be interesting to see you know, where those creative evolutions come, because at the end of the day, we're still making a sitcom starring a guy who was funny, and it's 22 minutes, and we're still making a cop show, a hospital show, and that hasn't really But if I can just challenge you at one point, technology has changed, uh, the, led or contributed to the decision to put Jay at 10 Completely, yeah. completely, and, uh, and and same with American Idol being on four months of the year, 50 episodes, and same with America's Got Talent being right. 40 hours for us, but and the Super Bowl, and Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, and um, the award shows all up year right. on year, so that communal so killer. Think about Got Talent, or your example. Susan Boyle was one of our uh, artists at Sony Music. It's millions and millions of streams mm -hmm. watched you know, over the internet, all over the world, with, frankly, not a lot of monetization. Yeah. All right? But in terms of the viewership, it was just massive over here for a show that was in the UK. Uh, became immediately uh, over the global network from the, the viral video, and a really important part of culture and an important artist uh, uh, potential for future in, in terms of Sony Music. But yet, no one has really figured out how do we take that and use that as a platform economically going forward. But the good news is there's this kind of experimentation going on, and the, and the openness that's available on the platform is allowing people to really harness it. And there's a lot of experiences getting, that we're getting from this transition from you know, broad uh, uh, television penetration where people are actually seeing these and then chopping things up, sending li you know, little snippets to people, building you know, asset value for you, but also creating some interesting artists and celebrities in the, in the meantime. Mm -hmm. um well, Rob, obviously, Sony is in a, in a complicated and interesting position because when you ask the question, how does the technology inform the kind of content that's created, you're in, you're in the technology and consumer electronics businesses, and a lot of what you think about is, is way, you know, ways to uh, build the whole... Uh, how would you say the Hollywood side of Sony has been influenced by the relationship with corporate Sony during the years that you've been there? Well, I think there's been a lot of experimentation. And it probably started off 
a bit forced, but I think as people got more comfortable and realized that the world was not going to come to the end, uh, with this kind of experimentation, it became, it became open. I mean, starting with, I think, uh, the launch of Blu-ray a couple of years ago when we were obviously in a war with Toshiba over formats, I think that the relationships that the studio had and that we all had with the other sister studios, uh, including Universal and, and Marvel and, and obviously even Disney, was a huge, Bob Iger was a huge supporter of Blu-ray. I don't think that could have been done unless we owned the studio and had a sense for the, what the important aspects of a new technology are to a content holder. What really makes these executives tick, how people view the future, what, what in terms of the consumer experience and protections people want. And I think, frankly, that's why we succeeded over Toshiba. And in fact, Toshiba, you know, this past week, you know, finally announced they were going to make their own Blu-ray player. And you know, it was, obviously, the war took longer than we expected. But it's over now. And then I think going back to last year where uh, with Sony Pictures Assistance, Sony was the first uh, company ever to send a high-definition movie straight to a television outside the conventional operators over the IP network uh -huh. uh, and had a very interesting buy rate, close to 10 percent, much higher than uh, uh, pay-per-view numbers. That was and again, talk. that, was a, yeah. that, was, that yeah. was a test, but it showed an openness on the part of the studios to do something experimental. And what was interesting, that was a month before DVD. So it was, again, giving someone a quality of an experience that you could not get elsewhere, adding value on our, on our electronic side. But we're going to have to keep experimenting. We're not really sure what the right mix is, and we have to right. keep working. David, uh, talk for a minute about how you view emerging formats, emerging technologies. I, I don't know, has Marvel announced whether they're doing anything in uh, 3D, for instance? I know not, you not 3D at this point. For you know, the live action films, it's not really the first topic, but there's a lot of other technologies which are pretty impactful. I mean, Blu-ray Live is something. Talk about experimentation. The ability to have you know, someone buy a DVD and have a interactive experience with other people and with the studio uh, is pretty exciting. And we're all trying to brainstorm ways to take advantage of that and you know, develop a product, uh, a DVD, which used to be static, which is now very interactive and very dynamic and can actually be a way to keep someone engaged on a movie or a brand in between the feature films. Um, even some of the other parts of our business, the, the classic comic book business, you know, uh, technologies are radically changing it. We have our core business of comics, which is very healthy, but it's still a place where you need to go to a comic book store or to a bookstore to buy the comics. Now we're bringing the comics online to any, to the iPhones, to any cellular phone. And so anyone around the world can now access the comics instantaneously on any screen. And that has the potential to create a whole renaissance in that industry um, of readers and of different dynamic ways to even enjoy the content, not just static, but eventually with animation and motion comics and so on. So it's, again, another way for us to expand the brands out, you know, hopefully to more and more customers. Right, cool. Um, I just wanted to encourage everyone to uh, send your questions up. Um, I'm actually surprised that nobody has written, is it true that Natalie Portman will be starring in Thor yet? But it <laughs> so falls on me to ask the question. That is true. OK, um, <laughs> good. Um, ben, uh, tell us about, let's talk about marketing for a minute. That's a, a big part of your purview. Um, a couple years ago, the, the idea was, well, because of DVRs, there's obviously live, and sports is good, and J news. Um, but talk about this idea of brand integration in programming and you know, how that is evolving right now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we're, as I said earlier, much more of a campaign partner for our advertising mm -hmm. clients and, uh, and not just uh, an environment after their create, creative ideas are put into place to then distribute those as 30-second spots. We are working much uh, closer together with advertisers. We worked with uh, Lauren Michaels and Pepsi, for example, uh, this year in and around Saturday Night Live and the Super Bowl with McGruber, where we did an ad uh, with Pepsi that started to play over uh, the weekend and paid off in uh, the Super Bowl as its premiere on, uh, in, you know, in front of over 100 million people. And that kind of uh, creative mojo of uh, Lauren Michaels and Will Forte and Seth Meyers and Kristen Wiig um, married to what Pepsi uh, gave as a, a brand initiative to, um, to the team 
it really was a kind of new form of ad agency on a certain level. You know, it was, it was directly between uh, the Pepsi brand and the Lauren Michaels creative shop. And, and that's an evolution. We're having more and more of those conversations further upstream to help really develop uh, ideas that can be leveraged across multiple platforms um, and tap into our, our intellectual property in a more profound way. Um, some of that being literally integrated inside a show, like uh, something I, I had done for NBC as a producer, The Restaurant, one of the more um, sure. big examples of that where literally the main title sequence had American Express, Mitsubishi, and Coors inside it, and they underwrote the whole program to um, things we've just done for Bing, the search engine, where Jimmy Fallon will actually communicate about Bing and show the functionality of Bing, where uh, the philanthropist, one of our shows, um, utilized Bing, and then they built an ad right after that, which sent people <clears throat> to utilize uh, the website, and they drove more traffic to the site during that uh, moment than they had at any other uh, time. So that kind of approach required us to sign NDAs with uh, Microsoft really early on to get the information at the same moment that the ad agency got it. And that's a, a really uh, new element to where uh, television is going as we face uh, the interruption and the on-demand anytime request of our consumer and that means things are time shifted or fast forwarded and the advertising message gets lost. So it becomes, we're partnered on a new show called Community this yeah. fall and we're, we're having a tremendously exciting conversations about things we're doing together inside that show with, with advertisers too. Got it. Um, we have a question over here. Hi, excuse me. Uh, my question is for uh, Ben Silverman. Um, how much lower were the upfront rates than last year, and how much bonus inventory, such as internet, did you have to include in the deal? Um, we have not finished the upfront. It's going down to the wire, but um, overall, we are not seeing uh, anything close to what uh, had been forecasted, meaning the declines um, will probably be more on the volume side than in the CPM side, um, so there may be more inventory uh, save for scatter because we're hopefully anticipating a rebound in 2010 when that, uh, when that uh, inventory would then be available and we think there's going to be marketers who sat out the upfront um, because of reorganization. Fiat Chrysler, for example, is going to have to come in and brand strongly once that's formalized. General Motors, once they decide which of those brands they want to push, are going to have to come back into the market. They, they're obviously greatly reduced. So I think we're, we're all collectively, as a broadcast business, playing for that return a little bit. So we haven't made as much of the volume deals as uh, we did last year, where maybe we were selling 85, 80% of the, the slates up front. Now um, I think it'll be a lower, a lower percentage than that. And, uh, and then in terms of the bonus uh, concept, what we're doing is really responding to the advertisers in building, I see my friends from TurboTax here, you know, building campaigns and, and plans that exist across all of our platforms. So activating something digitally that was built on the brand story side on air and also plays out across multiple channels and uses our content across all of that to kind of drive people to exactly, in that case, what TurboTax wanted you know, to be driven to. And so that's more how we're selling because that's the most effective engagement and activation response for our advertising client is when they buy the ad on TV and um, connect it online, they get a lot bigger return. Got it. Let me um, move in a slightly different direction over to you, Rob, and uh, recite a quote you usually gave, and you recently gave in Fortune magazine, of all places, which was to say that uh, Sony, uh, to paraphrase, Sony can no longer make, just make great TVs anymore, but it must, also, um, it, it must also have applications, or somebody will be the Google of TV. Um, t talk for a minute about this um, Kind of, this is probably the biggest deal in consumer electronics right now is the battle to integrate content and application and hardware. Yeah, it's, 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 it's fascinating because even hearing Ben speak and you're hearing about driving to the web, driving back to TV, and at some point this is all going to become integrated. And uh, so as you look forward and you think about most TVs being 
IP enabled, most TVs being wireless, and you think about how the consumer is using their devices. Right now, 19 million people watch online video via a PC connected to a TV. Now that is telling the consumer electronics business something. This goes back to when we were kids pre-Walkman when you took a tape recorder and you got a set of headphones and you made a tape and you carried it around. You didn't invent the Walkman, but you had a, an experience you wanted to have. And I think the consumers are speaking. They want this type of experience. And I think you always hear the anecdotes of someone saying, well, you know, my kid, he doesn't watch TV anymore. He's watching everything on his laptop. If you really think about it, they're on that laptop not because they want to sit in the cognitive position in front of a keyboard to watch entertainment. That's not really fun at a desk or whatever. It's access, it's, 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 it's a community, uh, and it's a, it's a good experience. And also, that kind of experience and that access and the broadness of what's available is what's really trumping quality. We saw that with MP3. MP3 is not nearly as high quality as, as you know, CDs or at the lower bit rates. So, um, I think people are willing to experiment with this and be in a situation in which uh, they, can, they can sit in their living room or lie on their bed and have a 10-foot experience of rich video on their television. And I think the real challenge for our industry is getting the kinds of things that Ben has on straight linear television to be able to provide richness on a television experience necessary but over the IP network because that's when you can start having real data in terms of what people are, uh, are uh, doing, and Bob Iger kind of related to this earlier. So not only what people are watching, but serving ads dynamically to based on who you are and what you like and what you watch. Why can't it be that when I turn on my TV that I have icons that show what all my friends are watching? Why isn't it if I want that it's automatically going to my Facebook saying what I'm watching or what my kids are watching, getting a sense for what everybody else is doing in your community? And that IP-enabled video is going to enable stuff like that. It's early, early days. But so I think you're going to see a transition over the next couple of years where clearly you have the core linear product of cable and satellite, but a lot of experimentation of IP delivered video straight to the TV. And this will be the first year that you'll see those kinds of sets in the market. And it's going to be very interesting to see how the consumer reacts. Sir. When most of us think of Hollywood, we think of uh, the general public of the star system. Could you talk about the impact of technology on the role of the star? Obviously, reality television was cheaper because you didn't have the stars on Facebook, social networking sites. Yeah. Everyone can become their own star. Could just yeah. discuss Maybe how that's David impacted David your... David could try first because you're yeah. a few in your orbit. Uh, yeah, oddly enough, for us, it's less the technology that's affecting the star system. It's more brands. I think we're seeing, you know, if you talk about reinventing Hollywood, I think you're seeing a lot of the, the, the popularity and the value and the profits go to franchises and brands, whether it be Harry Potter, whether it be Spider-Man, whether it be Iron Man. Um, and when you hear Rob talk about all these technologies and, and people watching, interacting with so many abilities and ways to access content, it sort of raises the question, what are they going to watch? And with all these choices, people are going to have to make some decisions and at least what we're seeing is people are gravitating towards brands and franchises that they have some affinity to or some relationship with. And when, when you have brands and franchises like that, you find that they drive a lot of the value. It takes the pressure off of having to necessarily get that superstar talent at a certain fee to justify a project. Um, so it gives us a lot more flexibility to try and find the right actor, the right director for a project, rather than someone who is required to necessarily sell the tickets or bring people to the screen. Yeah, you're seeing that. I mean, the biggest movie, Hangover, had, you know, no, exactly. no stars, Transformers, you know, you're looking at Star Trek, you know, with the, the, the new guys, Kevin James, you know, making more money than, mm -hmm. so I think, I think you're, you're seeing uh, also real pressure on uh, the, sal the pressure we're feeling on the top line side is, is being passed down to everybody we collaborate with to create, produce, film, cinematography, you know, across the board, um, there, there is real pressure. And, uh, you know, I don't know if in five years you have that many gross players in, in the movie business. Uh, it's already starting. I mean, I think that you look at the recent declines that we've had in the home video business, a lot of that driven by traffic into retail, you know, Walmart, Best Buy, 
because you know DVDs still are very much an impulse purchase. Uh, that is now flowing into uh, our community, and I think over the next 18 months, you're going to see this new batch of films where there's a lot more kind of say partnership elements with talent and other uh, participants to make these models work because we we got to work together to to keep this a viable business. Right. Exactly. Sir. Yeah. I'll, I'll start. I'll start with Ben. Um, the networks are, are more constrained than anybody else because of the FCC in many ways. I'm, I'm actually a little surprised to hear the panel still talking about television versus the internet versus, I mean, they're just screens. It's just one thing. You know, when we used to say, what do you, I saw Casablanca last night at Theater 80 St. Mark's or on WOR, you were very specific about how you got it. My kids just say, I saw The Lion King. They aren't specific at all about how it's delivered. So I'd really like to hear what you think life is like in a world where it's just not considered TV anymore. It's just something that's being delivered to you. Or do you not think that that's going to happen? No, I think that you know, we're an editorial brand in that world. You know, and so we still provide, and we may even all find, and that's a, another thing cable's been doing very well, is they've really been able to define a specific brand. We are TV for women. We are, you know, we are entertainment television. We are, and they really uh, have been able to, I think, nail that editorial brand. So you're turning on, in a way, your show is the television channel brand. But I also think what Rob's talking about, I think all three of us, all four of us, see a world of a converged world, you know, and, and when those TVs start operating and you're just plugging one thing in the back, I think it, it absolutely uh, will continue, but also to David's point, but the big content engines of a, a Spider-Man or an Iron Man are, are still going to be consumed within, within that screen, and we all believe we should give the consumer what they want, you know, so we're, we're all pushing out towards trying to, if, if that's where it goes, we want them, you know. I mean, it's a va the IP network is vast, and there's a role for someone like Ben and his organization to curate quality entertainment, and people are searching for what they think is relevant, what appeals to them, what their friends are watching. And uh, so these brands, specific brands, these shows, and these, you know, are, do have uh, strong relevance because it's vast out there, and to find it, and the amount of access that you're going to have, and that's really going to be the trick. How do you sit lying on a bed with the whole world at your fingertips in terms of video and find what you want. And that's what everybody is really struggling with right now. And I think there are a lot of great ideas out there and they're starting to work. And you see with what's happening with Hulu, even upstarts like Boxy. Uh, there's a lot of experimentation and it's, it's a good, it's important because we, entertainment is going to move clearly back from the PC to the uh, living room where it belongs. I think what we've seen in terms of laptop usage is really just, it's a voice of wanting access and control and, and, and community. David, in, in your case, in the film business, uh, how much does this un technological uncertainty contributed to um, the big story in Hollywood has been, you know, obviously with the credit crisis, the inability of people to get funded and to mm -hmm. forecast. So wh when, you're, when you're projecting Marvel five, 10 years from now, how are you, how are you looking at, uh, business model change as part of the outlook? For, for us, it's, it's, we've been fortunate where we're going through such a fundamental change that a lot of the, the macro trends are not yet affecting us because we're going from zero films to one film to two films to maybe three films. And so we have organic growth in the, what's happening to the industry, to the more mature players, is a little bit less of an impactful to us because it's overshadowed by the organic growth. At the same time, what we're seeing is that the quality content, the quality word of mouth, the quality brands are the ones that are doing better in the technologically challenged areas. You know, if you look at the DVD marketplace and, and which ones, which brands are doing better in the last quarter, we were fortunate to do very well. I think a lot of the animation companies were, were able to do very well. So it, it puts, I'm not sure if it necessarily fundamentally changes the movie making business, but I think it pushes it to uh, brands and franchises and very high quality content that has not just a good opening weekend but a good enough word of mouth so that it plays well in all the other technologies whatever they might be four five eight years from now where people have so much choice and I think we're gonna see a real lack of forgiveness to those 
big uh, films that might open and not have very good word of mouth and reviews in those ancillary markets. Interesting. Um, we're, we're almost at the end of this session, so let me, let me just have a very quick question to all the panels, which is, uh, among technologies that uh, affect your business, what, what, are, what are you most excited about? What do you think has the most potential? Because there is a lot of, uh, a lot of bad news these days, so uh, let's hear where you're actually thinking, okay, this thing could actually help our business and isn't a value destroyer. Maybe uh, start with Ben, and then Rob, and then David. Um, you know, I'm bullish to the question in the front here on the notion that the cumulative usage is all up. You know, as I look across this uh, group here and see everybody multitasking, you know, that we're, uh, hopefully they're listening to us also, but the notion is, um, <laughs> the, the notion of, you know, doing everything more is kind of, continuing to happen. TV usage is up, internet usage is up, smartphone uh, usage is up in terms of watching uh, video, and I, I, I'm very bullish on video being a driver in the, in the next uh, 25 years at an exponential rate. I think, you know, more and more and more, and there are only a couple of really good, consistent video producers. And it's a reason that our uh, companies have, um, you know, been in business a very long time, and um, from the turn of the century, you know, and uh, you're going to see that we've just evolved as the business has evolved. You know, NBC started in radio, then we went to TV, then we went to color, then we went to stereo, you know, then we went to 1080 uh, HD, and uh, and we'll continue to evolve. But I think the content itself um, will. Um, be more and more valuable. I look at the Chicago Cubs selling for almost a billion dollars, and I think about as we head over into this cacophony, the big idols, even when they fall and they may break their ear off or be missing an arm, are still gonna be the biggest idols to the point of the franchise, et cetera. And there's gonna be real value in a, in a world of infinite choice to somebody helping make choices for you. Oh. Rob. I, mean, I th it, it's, it is incredibly exciting. I mean, if you think about it, it's not so long ago you'd go out and you'd buy a, hopefully a Sony TV, you'd leave the store, and we would never communicate with you again. Maybe you send in a warranty card, and then maybe a couple of years ago we'd have your email address. And now that, that opportunity with that television wirelessly connected to the IP network, that I have a sense, uh, and our company has a sense for the kinds of things that you're interested in, to the extent you want us to know that, the, uh, the, how you use it, time to use it and to give you things that are important to you. And we, we didn't even talk about you know, DVRs and ad skipping and things. I mean, there is no question that with the right contextualization, the right knowledge of the consumer to the extent they want it, they will be watching ads because they will be interesting to you. I mean, there's shows that I like where you know, I'm being advertised, you know, PMS, you know, aspirin, right? <laughs> Not too relevant. I may be skipping through that right now. So you can think about the opportunities you have. So that kind of constant communication and knowledge has to create value and more opportunities for us to create value in the content, create value for the consumer. And that clearly, in that connected word world, is you know, where we see the opportunity. The targeting. Yeah. Cool. Last word to you, David. Yeah, I think the most exciting technological development for us is definitely uh, the ability to interact directly with our customer, whether it be Marvel.com or our portal on uh, cell phones. But the ability to not just now make content, but the next phase of our evolution, be part of the distribution of that, be part of creating the community about it, to have the ability not necessarily to have a third party between us and the customer all the time, and, and have that freedom which we never would have had without the changes in technology. Uh, so that's an exciting thing for us to figure out how to best use and hopefully how to monetize. Cool. Uh, thank you very much to all three gentlemen. Thank for you. Great panel. Thank you. Stephanie.